Education Foundation in terms of fostering discussions in classrooms about what is happening that's political in the world of sports. And yeah, I'm calling you Jan. It's Jan, yeah. Jan, I'm sorry. It's all right. No, I was going to ask you, Dave, because it seemed to me one thing that's not in the film at all is any discussion of doping. And I wonder if you view doping as a political um, aspect. And I know I read your recent piece on Lance that, you, that came out this week, and it is awesome. I just wonder if you talk about that a little bit and, and how you view the whole doping world at this point in sports. Oh, yeah. I mean, doping is definitely political. I mean, my goodness, just ask them on Capitol Hill when they will simulcast on ESPN and C-SPAN when they do the hearings about doping. I mean, it's... I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing. Like, I think that the discussion about performance enhancing drugs has actually served to make us collectively stupider about what they are and who they help and who they don't help and how they should operate. And I think if they're, my, my personal feelings about them is that if, I certainly think it's political. I certainly think the way it's discussed is political. I, th I certainly think that the way, like this is the, the number one political thing, I've been unfortunately writing about this a lot recently, is that the way, the way that the feds and the U.S. Attorney's Office uses these hearings as a way to trap athletes in perjury and now, at, um, people like Jeff Nowitzki, who people might have heard of, who's the FBI agent, or uh, I'm sorry, the IRS agent who like steals garbage and, and brings it home to his house and puts it on his kitchen table and sorts through the trash. I mean, he had a lot of like, and, and he's like bragging about the fact that he's going to write a book about how much he hates Barry Bonds and, and judges have accused him of disregarding the Constitution. And he gets to be the hero in the American media about this, um, this aggressive agent who's standing up to steroids. I, it disturbs me because I think something all of us probably agree on, otherwise we wouldn't be looking into sports is that it's not just sports. It sends messages, like you say in the film, about how the world should work. And so when you have this very high octane expression that says the federal government has the right to go into your lives and turn it upside down based on what you did or did not inject or ingest or what have you, it sends a message that says this kind of federal prosecutorial power in our lives is somehow okay and acceptable. And I personally see that there's like a connection between like the the multi-million dollar bonds, witch hunts, and the way dozens of activists in the Midwest were, have, you know, have had their lives turned upside down because the federal government's gone into their house and gone through their stuff and, and gone after them. Like, there's a connection there to me about what is deemed acceptable or unacceptable through this high-octane cultural lens. And so, so yeah, I mean, I mean, if I can wave a magic wand and say no PEDs in sports and it'll all be done the old-fashioned way, I would do it, but then it would raise the question like, well, what was there ever an old-fashioned way? Which makes it then a very difficult pretzel once you get it. I mean, when I read the story about Babe Ruth taking a sheep's testicles and mashing them up and attempting to inject them into his arm, that was one of the things where I said, wow, nobody was ever trying to do this uh, too purely. By the way, it made him ill, so people shouldn't try that at all. <laughs> but just, uh, you know, there's no age of purity to go back to. Unless uh, segregation and gluttony is purity, but I'm, 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 I'm going. Uh, I'm, I'm gendering it just so people know. Um, three point. Just everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. Then the gentleman back there. And then one. So one of the things that disturbed me is that access to a lot of sports is like box, box soccer. So there are alternative uh, channels developing out here for. Uh, not to, I mean, not to my knowledge. I mean, I know people who, does it, if anybody else knows the answer to that, that would be great. If you could say that there are alternative uh, channels to, to watch uh, s sports through mass media, that's not something I see at all. So that would certainly be a lovely development. Um, I'm actually disturbed by uh, this recent development by ESPN, which I don't know if people know about, but the, the, the plans for ESPNW, just the idea of, of an all-women's website. This is their way of combating I think directly the Messner and Cookie report, like, wow, women's coverage dropped to 1.6%. It's like, okay, we're going to do ESPNW, which will be all women's sports, and we'll try to spin it off into a channel. And, but meanwhile, it, just, it seems like a way to, to ghettoize women's sports and separate it off and, and like actually entrench those kinds of binaries, which I think we should be fighting against and fighting for much more, like boys and girls playing together. And it's a little hard to do that when they say, no, you have a separate channel just for you.
And it's especially ridiculous given the recent NCAA finals where the women's final was so just objectively more entertaining and interesting than what the men brought out in the center court. So, so little thing. Yeah. Building on what you were saying on athletes today as political voices, I was hoping you could comment on your kind of organization of Job for Justice, sort of the work of players that you talk about, and kind of where they're at and what exactly that is and, and what your relationship with them is. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a sort of a de facto thing that I did called um, Jocks for Justice. Because uh, it's interesting about like what, and this goes to the question by the gentleman in the back, like, like what you can or cannot get players to speak out against. Like I found, for example, it's very difficult to get an active player to say, hey, those public dollars for the stadiums, I'm against that. Like that that's a tough sell. But what it comes down to, and this is like the key of understanding the 1960s too, it's like, why did Bill Russell and Jim Brown, I mean the greatest athletes of their day, why did they speak out um, against racism? Because they were affected by racism. I mean, it affected them very directly. Why have several dozen uh, Latino players spoken out against the All-Star Game being in Arizona this year because they're worried about their own families when they go down there and have said that explicitly. Like what happens if their family doesn't have their papers and they get pulled over? So, so it's like it's, it's when it affects you directly and um, tragically one of the features of 21st century America of course is like the you know, deindustrialization in the, in the inner cities and um, the complete flattening of, of black America at, at the uh, working and, and working class level, and um, and so uh, many many athletes come from uh, working class or poor families, and many athletes have relatives who are in prison, and so the Jocks for Justice thing started by talking about the issue of the death penalty, and then talking about the issue of people like Kenneth Foster, who's not on, who was on death row here in Texas, and uh, talking about. Um, the issue of uh, the Gina Six in uh, Louisiana, and going to athletes and getting them to sign on to a statement saying that they wanted a new trial, that they wanted people off death row, and one of the ones that we did, which was um, important to us, that we're going to revive is the case of Troy Davis, who's on death row in Georgia right now, and we're going to fight to get Troy Davis off of death row. Because that needs to happen. And, I mean, when you, you don't know the case, when you have nine people who say you killed somebody and seven of them recant, it's a pretty good indication that someone shouldn't have to die. And that's what Troy Davis is up against. And what's crazy is like, what I found is that the reverse is true as well. Like when you talk to people on death row, it's like they went to high school with somebody who's now a famous athlete, or their cousin is a famous athlete. Hell, one of the members of the Gina Six, I mean, these were high school students who were facing decades behind bars for getting in a schoolyard fight. And one of the members of the Gina Six, things got too hot in Gina, Louisiana. He went to live uh, with his cousin who was starting for the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, so these connections between the fact that you have this wholesale jailing of a section of black America and the fact that sports draws upon black America for its talent is what was really the start of Jocks for Justice. Because it's like, okay, because they were like, yeah, this affects me and I want to do something about it and say something about it. And, um, uh, I'm just going to go across because it's easier. Yes, sir. Um, I guess I had a question. I just wanted to get your, your comments on this. Because when I look at uh, kind of the, the atmosphere of the United States, especially the political atmosphere and, and how it interacts with sports, I guess. You know, it's kind of the ESPN versus CNN. You know, I kind of almost see ESPN is more relevant, even if they're doing political stories, than maybe even CNN is. So I guess, should we be writing letters to our congressman or to our local sports, you know, hero to try to get, you know, political issues?